Uh, I'm going to talk about um, work that I do, which is called social network analysis. And I'm going to talk especially about um, what you can do with data that you find on the net. So there's all sorts of interesting patterns in the net. And uh, I'm going to show you some examples and explain how I, how I got these. Most of the time, I work for um, large companies, um, nonprofits, once in a while a government institution, um, but mostly mapping out networks in these organizations or between these organizations and trying to help them understand how these networks work and how they can possibly work better uh, for these uh, various clients. So um, this, whole, uh, this whole presentation kind of got started from this article that I, got, um, that I got mentioned in. And sometimes you don't know, you know kind of what you have until somebody tells you the, you know, the obvious. And so um, you know, I never thought of myself as a uh, kind of wiki intelligence kind of person wh when you know, the uh, Christian Science Monitor here wrote this thing up. And I thought, yeah, well, that's interesting. There's, there's not just this, this information about 9-11, but there's all sorts of other information out there that people can use as, as, as open source intelligence to do all sorts of interesting analysis for their own benefit or for any organization that they, that they work for. And so um, what I do is, is social network analysis. And it's both a visual and a mathematical way of analyzing networks or analyzing how people interact, exchange information, how things flow from one object to another. And social network analysis was originally created back in the 30s and 40s uh, to, from a kind of a sociological and an anthropo anthropological perspective to look at people and their organizations. But it's amazing how we can take that technology and actually analyze lots of different types of networks. So we can take social network analysis and we could actually uh, look at parts of the internet. We can look at how autonomous systems are connected and do analysis that way. We can look at uh, how books on Amazon are connected, and we'll actually go through that example soon. So I started with a language called Prolog. How, how many of you even know what Prolog is? All right. How many of you have actually programmed in Prolog? Wow, that's great. How many of you still program in Prolog? Right, that's what I thought. No hands. <laughs> well, I actually still some programming in Prolog, although um, I have programmers, and unfortunately, I have to go to London, England to find good Prolog programmers. And so uh, I still do some programming, and I send them specs in Prolog code. So I'll write up some Prolog code. They'll take a look at it, get a good laugh, and then you know my 80 lines of code, they'll change to 18 lines of code and, and send me something back. And, but but Prolog is a great language, especially for, for, for networks, because it's, it's a relational language, and networks are all about relationships and how things are related and how things flow. And it's a fun language to play around with. It's a fun language to, to experiment with. It's a fun language to try things out, see how they work. It's interpreted. You, try, you, know, you change something, try it, see how it works, and you just keep going. So it's, a, so it's fun to experiment, but then... You know, when I'm done experimenting and I think I got something, I send it off to, you know, to the real, the real programmers. But, you know, like I say, it's, it's fun for hacking sociology because networks are all about how people interact, how organizations interact, how communities interact, how groups interact. And so Prolog is a great language for, for modeling all that. And this is a simple interface of the software that uh, we developed many years ago. It's called Inflow, and it's uh, almost 100% prolog. It's like 99% prolog. And it's compiled, and it runs, you know, runs pretty good, even though it's uh, uh, you know, in, at the basis is an interpreted language. So those of you that miss prolog, here's some prolog code. And, uh, and here's some prolog code that, that basically 
explains kind of what we do. And so you can see that, you know, it's very easy to quickly do something and, and, and get something done in Prolog. That's one of the things I like about it is, is you don't have to write lines and lines and lines of code. It's real easy to quickly state your problem and find a solution. So we can just, we can start very simply by just saying, you know, two people are friends. And then we could say, well, we could state two people are friends or we could give a rule for how people are friends. So the second uh, uh, predicate there, friend X and Y, a person X has a certain, certain types of interests, person Y has different interests. At the intersection of persons X interests and Y interests meet at least 50%, we'll consider them as possible friends. So kind of birds of a feather flock together. That's, that's the rule there. We can also do friend of a friend. So it's very simple that if uh, X and Y are friends and Y and Z are friends and X and Z are friends of friends. So again, two lines of code to quickly do a, a somewhat complex uh, relationship. We can find groups very easily too. So X and Y know each other, Y and Z know each other, X and Z know each other. That's the basis of a, of a group. No, I don't need that. And then um, social network analysis has, has, has metrics. And so one of the most simple metrics is this thing called degrees that just looks at how many connections you have. Again, just kind of two, two lines of code. Find all your friends, put, put them in a list, see how long the list is, and there's, there's your degree metric. And some of the other metrics are more complicated. But this is basically the way I started almost 20 years ago with this type of code. I had to do a project for, a class, for two classes I was taking at UCLA. And so I started with code like this. And then one thing led to another and eventually quit my day job and do this type of analysis full time. And uh, when you're looking on the net and you're looking for uh, data to map and data to analyze, uh, what we do is we often follow this uh, approach called snowball sampling. And since we're all in Cleveland, we're all very familiar with snowballs. And, and it, it's basically a way of following the data. So, so you start with, with one place, you start with a person, with an organization, with a, with a group, and we normally then go out two steps from that. So if you were to map a network around me, you would look at who, who I'm connected to. One of the people I'm connected to is right here in the audience, Steve Goldberg. Then you'd see who he's connected to, and you would go out two steps that way. And then you could quickly see the person, their friends, friends of friends, and, and you'd see the network around them. And then you combine these networks for, for various individuals or various organizations, and when they overlap, that's when you get this larger group network. And uh, so who has heard of the concept six degrees of separation? Okay, yeah, just about everybody. There's also a book out by that name. And what's the common thing? They tell us six degrees of separation, and then usually the second sentence you hear is, isn't, isn't it a small world? But actually, six degrees of separation is not a small world. It's a very large world. And what's a small world is two degrees of separation or two steps in the network. What we're finding in, in both practical experience and what the academics are finding in research is that every network has a horizon. So just like the planet has a horizon that we can't see over, the same thing happens in networks. And that network horizon is somewhere around two steps. So we know, so I know Steve and I know a lot about him. And I know Gloria and, and, and about her. But Steve's friends, uh, I kind of know who some of them are, but I don't know who all of them are. Same, same with Gloria's. But Steve's friends' friends, I basically know, know, know nothing about. And same with Gloria's friends' friends. And so at three steps, things start to get real fuzzy in, our, in the network. And at four steps, we're basically blind and in the network. So the, the key links in any network, especially in your own social network, are the one and two step links. That's where you could do something, that's where you can influence things, and that's where uh, kind of the important relationships are. So when you 
get this data, you can track it in a spreadsheet. And here's a simple way that we track data. We look at the from node, the to node, and then the strength of the tie or the link, and then whatever network it's in. And so again, the data is real simple. Baldus is connected to Steve. Steve is connected to Gloria. We, again, we can see very quickly how, how the links grow and how the, how the networks grow. And you can keep a spreadsheet like this going as you collect data over time. Another way to do it is if you have software like, like what we have, is you can just draw the links in. So we have tools in there that allow you to just draw the network. And as you're drawing the network, the database gets created, the links get created, and everything is ready for you to go. So this is when I was doing the 9-11 network. I was basically reading the New York Times, Washington Post, LA Times, all sorts of things like that online. And when I'd find a new relationship, I'd say, ah, OK, I have both of these people already in here. I'd go get my link tool, and then I'd just drag from the node on the left to the node on the right. And it would then bring up a dialog box. I'd fill that in about the relationship, and boom, it's done. More, more of the network is, uh, is complete. So one of the first networks that I drew um, was this uh, network of internet industry partnerships. And, uh, and, this, and mostly, I got this information before the, uh, be, before the dot comedy broke and, and busted in early 2000. And this type of information is available all, in all sorts of places on the net. It's available as, as, as press releases. It's available on companies' websites. And basically, two nodes are linked together if they have announced some type of partnership, so either a strategic alliance or a joint venture or anything like that. So we see some of the big players are like IBM and Microsoft and and AOL Time, Time Warner. And then if we want to, we can you know, zoom into that cloud of relationships and just look at two nodes off by themselves. So right here, we zoom in, and we just look at two nodes and their direct connections. So that's one step connection for, for each one. And then we see that some of the links overlap. Um, George Nemeth, who, who does Brew, Brewed Fresh Daily, and I were uh, working with uh, Ed Morrison, who was at REI at the time. And we were wondering what, what the Cleveland economic development community looks like. So George and I spent a couple hours on the web, just going from website to website of various Cleveland organizations, just looking how, how we're connected. So we see the Cleveland Foundation on here. We see all the universities. We see uh, Bioenterprise, we see uh, Glide, you know, we see all sorts of Gun Foundation, all sorts of organizations. And all this information is, is available on their, on, the, on their website. They say partners, you know, these are people we're funding, things like that. And so again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to spot the relationships that are obvious in the, in the data that's out there. So again, a couple hours of web surfing, just keeping those link pairs, putting them in a spreadsheet. George sent me what he found. I combined it with what I found. And we had a quick map of, of Northeast Ohio's economic development community. A friend of mine uh, works up at uh, University of Michigan, and he has access to all sorts of autonomous